do we have to leave it there? And when we come back, how did Canada's relations with China remain frozen while other Five Eyes countries have moved on? I talked to a Canadian scholar to find out. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Canada's China panic is handmade. A paper published earlier this month by University of Victoria's Centre for Asia-Pacific Initiatives traces the roots of exaggerated concerns about China in the land of America's northern neighbour. Titled The Five Eyes and Canada's China Panic, the document points out that it all started with meetings held early in 2018 among intelligence agencies of the so-called Five Eyes countries, namely the United States, UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. The paper says that the head of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, uncritically accepted US accusations against China back then and informed fully the government of Canada. This led to about turns in Canada's China policies, which, coupled with racism and anti-communism, mutated over the next five years to become Canada's China panic. What exactly are the findings of the paper? How, according to the author, did Canada's official relations with China remain frozen while other Five Eyes countries have moved on, including the United States and how credible are these statements. I will be joined by the leading author of this paper, Professor John Price, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Victoria, joining, joining me from Havana, Cuba. But first, let's go to our guest, Professor Rong Ying, Senior Research Fellow of the China Institute of International Studies joining me from Beijing. Professor Rong, thank you very much for joining us. So um, give us a, a picture of uh, exactly where uh, things are in terms of China-Canada relations. As we said, Australia improved its relations with China. The United States have been trying to stabilize things. Where is Canada? Well, the relationship certainly, as you rightly said, it's difficult. Uh, I'm very, and I'm very unfortunate. I think China made it very clear, as we have seen uh, during the conversation, phone conversation between Wang Yi, the Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and the Canadian counterpart, that China attached importance to the relationship, but the relationship is difficult. There are a lot of work to do. I think the report uh, by Professor uh, Price. Price and his colleagues, yeah are very much important, shedding a light and insight of what is happening behind. And most importantly, I think the consequences or the worrying side of the, uh, uh, the dynamic in the, about the changes of, of uh, Canadians' policy towards China. And this is, I think, a very important uh, report. I would only hope that this would start the process of reassessment or relook mm. of what happened 
in yeah. Canada about its relationship with China and for the region and the world as whole. Well. Basically, the report uh, talked about whatever threat China may present to countries in the West, such as Canada, has been blown out of proportion. It talked about three kinds of threat that had been blown out of proportion. The techno threat, so-called, the viral threat, meaning China unleash this viral to the world and, you know, harming a lot of people and thirdly, uh, the kind of, of uh, you know, hegemonic power that China is, or, or military threat that China is potentially imposing. And yet, instead of independently verifying these threats, these were just taken as facts and conveyed to the Canadian government, which then incorporated these elements into making policies for the country. Professor Rong, how do you look at that. How was this China threat materialized in Canada? Yeah, that's exactly the, the big question I think we want to answer. We want, uh, I think certainly Canadians will have to answer, the Canadian people and the politicians have to answer. Because the uh, so-called China uh, uh, threat, uh, they have been there for many years. Different schools, variations, and the China panic is relatively new, but the so so no, the sinophobia is, I think, very much uh, unique or special in this context, where it is looks at the uh, paper would like us to know that it is very much enmeshed, mm -hmm. it's very much I mean, uh, linked to the okay. dynamic of politics in in Canada mm -hmm. and the very question of the. I mean, the relevance and the vitality of uh, Canada's uh, uh, democracy, values, mm -hmm. uh, rules, yeah. and the norms. How could they, and the security uh, established, influenced by a foreign country, even though it's an ally, to, I mean, make or influence the policy making of, uh, of, me... ind of independent and yeah. sovereign state yeah, let's, and let's... For, with a, another important country. Yeah. yeah, let's hear from the leading author of the report, um, Professor John Price, joining me from Havana. Um, Professor Price, thank you very much for taking your time out for us. Uh, according to the paper, you said, as it turns out, Canada's spy agency, the CSIS, was the main source for the 2018 accusation regarding China's techno threat. What is more important, you said, however, is the means by which the CSIS determined that such a threat existed. One might expect, you said, that with thousands of employees and a billion dollar budget between them, CSIS and the CSE, which is the Canadian Security Establishment, might have come up with an independent assessment of actual challenges or threats in Canada. But instead, Canada's spy agencies relied on its counterparts in the United States. Um, do you think that is the biggest problem for the policy of Canada, especially when it comes to China? Well, thanks very much for inviting me uh, on the program. Um, as a historian, I was intrigued uh, by the fact that universities in Canada constantly remarked that CSIS, CSIS, the security agency, had approached them in 2018 uh, about the supposed China threat. And that uh, uh, piqued my curiosity because uh, the Meng Wanzhou uh, affair and the arrests of the two Canadians only occurred in December of uh, 2018, right. uh, much later. So as a historian, I was intrigued to find why did CSIS uh, make the, uh, a pitch to Canadian universities that China was such a threat? And so I followed the paper trail, and indeed it went back to the uh, CIA and FBI and to the accusations they made in front of Congress in February of 2018 that were then um, taken up by CSIS. So yes, I think that... Um, one of the reasons that happened is, and that the uh, government accepted those ideas, was that, first of all, CSIS has become much stronger uh, uh, through the war on terror and through the regimes of the 
uh, Harper uh, conservative government, CSIS obtained much more power uh, within government. And uh, so that was one element that led to this uh, situation. And the second was uh, the fact that the Canadian government, uh, the Liberal government, was uh, became a minority government in 2019. Uh, and uh, was reliant on the support of the New Democratic Party in order to get legislation passed. Unfortunately, the New Democratic Party took a very hostile line towards China, uh, the government of China, uh, and, um, uh, and so as a result, uh, things uh, got worse instead of uh, getting better. So basically, you're talking about the China panic is unfounded. It's been blown out of proportion uh, because people didn't do their homework. They, they said, okay, the United States told us this is the case and it fits our interest, so we're going to make it facts and, and tell it to the people. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think there was uh, what is commonly uh, called threat inflation. That is, it's uh, taking a potential threat and inflating its importance uh, and uh, creating an enemy where there may be indeed uh, problems and contradictions and issues that need to be addressed between countries such as Canada and China. Uh, but then those issues are taken to represent a hostile uh, approach uh, on the part of, in this case, China, uh, viewed from the Canadian government side, from CSIS, uh, and then, of course, we had the many uh, facets of uh, the domestic politics of what happened with the Mawanjo affair, the arrests of the Michaels. We then had uh, COVID and the um, whole uh, anti-China uh, rhetoric that arose, the uh, Sinophobia regarding uh, uh, COVID uh, as being uh, something uh, a part of the conspiracy theory in terms of uh, China trying to uh, infect the world. These sorts, of, this type of nonsense was uh, promoted a lot. And uh, and then uh, after uh, the Sinophobia related to COVID and the anti-Asian racism that arose, we have all the discourse related to China as uh, being a, a, a source of political interference, right. which was pushed by CSIS. Uh, through CSIS leaks and then so through the media. Uh, yeah. yeah. How ridiculous. I mean, from my perspective, it is very ridiculous. But obviously, it's been um, prevalent. It's been popular, especially on the media, for quite some years and resulting in the very low relationship between the two sides. Only now the Canadian side is talking about trying to bring this relationship back on track. But damage has been done and it's uh, very difficult. Yes, well, I think that what has become clear is that the Canadian government has become an outlier, uh, whereas the U.S., which has been the source of many of the threat inflator uh, narratives, uh, has tried to walk back some of that and reestablish uh, better relations with China. The U.S. Uh, Biden regime has sent uh, many delegations uh, and uh, President Biden and uh, China's President Xi Jinping met uh, at the APEC summit in San Francisco. Uh, but Canada has been unable to address uh, the situation and, and things have gotten worse and worse. Um, so Canada has become an outlier diplomatically. And so it's becoming clear to many people that something weird is going on. Uh, why can't Canada adjust its relations? Even though some, uh, like Melanie Jolie, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is now talking about uh, trying to uh, initiate better relations with all types of governments and that we mustn't uh, divide right. the world up into two hostile camps. But she represents still a minority voice, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, finally, how do you defend the credibility of your report? Because you do not have inside information. You pieced up public information together. What is the cred credibility of your, view, of your statement? Keep it very short. Well, that's please. a good question. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I think that um, you know. 
the uh, <clears throat> one of the main political newspapers in Ottawa is uh, reproducing uh, many aspects of the report uh, through uh, opinion pieces. So I think it has enough credibility that it's being taken seriously, although there's a lot of people who don't agree with the report. Hmm. Well, we'll wait and see once again. This is a discussion paper and people are encouraged to take a look at it and see the content for themselves. We have to leave it there.